I'm getting back where I can see people. Let me just go up there. Glad to have you in class this morning. This was supposed to be George's class, but George is preaching today. and We just didn't feel like it was right for him to do all the work <clears throat> on the holiday weekend. So I'm finishing up a series that I haven't been in one single time. But I think all of us are familiar with forgiveness, and that's what the series is about. We've had lessons on, or you have had lessons on, what does Jesus teach about forgiveness, the unforgiving servant, Simon and the sinful woman, the prodigal son, the woman caught in adultery. Okay. Let's have a word of prayer as we get started. Holy Father, thank you for this beautiful new day of life that you've given us. We praise you, Father, for your goodness, your mercy, the fact that you love us incredibly much, more than we can understand, and we thank you that you have called us into your fellowship and have called us out of darkness into your marvelous light, that you have forgiven us of our sins through the blood of Jesus. Father, we, we understand that. We often mention it. But we also know that we often forget what a treasure that is and how valuable. As we look at our lesson today through your word, we pray you'd help each of us to be reminded again how awesome your love is and how desperately we need your forgiveness. We thank you for Jesus. Thank you for Peter and his example. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're talking about Peter and Jesus today. I saw on television a couple days ago um, where somebody in a different town, different city, had been in prison for over 20 years for a multiple murder which he did not commit. I think it was like 20 to 25 years. And he's finally released. And uh, he was not holding a grudge or anger at anybody, was just thankful to be out. When we talk about forgiveness, so he forgave those who wronged him, but he was paying a penalty for something he did not do. All of us have sinned. Is that not correct? And we deserve punishment. But Jesus has taught us that he uh, not only wants to forgive, but he will forgive, can forgive. And uh, <clears throat> what a wonderful thing that is for us. In Ephesians chapter 1, I've, I've preached through Ephesians, and all other preachers, of course, we, we teach from Ephesians. But I just want to remind you of this verse one more time as we get started. Ephesians 1, 7, In him... We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. Forgiveness is an attitude of heart that we choose to give somebody. Has anybody here ever been wronged by somebody else? I mean, at least once, right? Right? And you choose whether or not you want to forgive them. Sometimes people have a hard time. Well, I'm not going to forgive them unless they, you know, repent or tell me they're sorry or whatever. And that's, we hear that often. And perhaps that's us from time to time. But I want to say that forgiveness is something that we want, but we also need to give. Or we choose not to hold another person's sins or mistakes or crimes against them. That's what we want from Jesus for us. He does not choose to hold those things against us. Even though he knows everything. Turn your Bible to Matthew 4, please. Matthew 4. Of course, Jesus is 
the Son of God. He became flesh and dwelt among us. And he chose his disciples. He chose those who were going to be his close associates, his apostles. And in chapter 4, verse 18, it says, Now as Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. So remember that phrase, that text right there, because it will carry us through the end of this uh, study about fishing. So Peter was a fisherman, we understand that. He was a burly man, he was no wimp, he was strong, and he, all of us have loved the study of his character. Uh, he's one of my favorite people to study because he's, he's just so real in the scriptures. He's not, you know, he, Jesus talks a lot about it. He chose him first. So he was always first. He was chosen first. And it seems like he always wants to speak up first, right? And he's a person who acts first, generally speaking. He was always that, I got you. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to go. I'm, I'm your man. So Jesus chose him to be a follower of Jesus and to be a fisher of men, not just fish. And really, that's when he was... They followed him. They stopped fishing, right? Right? They were done fishing as a job. Now it's time to serve the Lord. In Matthew chapter 16, turn over there, another very familiar passage. In chapter 16, verse 13, Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi and he was asking his disciples... Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, well, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, or still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And who speaks up first? Peter. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven... I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. The gates of Hades will not overpower it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. And then he warned the disciples they should tell no one that he was the Christ. So Peter has a right answer, right? And Jesus says, Right on, you got it. So Peter was a person that had a certain amount of, I don't know, how would you describe Peter? Somebody throw out some words about Peter. Pardon? Impulsive? Outspoken? Rash? Eager? I, one of the words that comes to my mind is gung-ho. That's not a Bible word. I haven't found that one yet. What's that? Zealous, zealous is a Bible word. That's a, good, that's a better one. He's very zealous. He's eager and zealous. All those things you said, he's got a lot of qualities that uh, make him a very strong personality. And uh, he's one that that I, of course, all of us like to study about him. And, he, and here he has the right answer of who Jesus is. And, and, and then Jesus even says, you're going to have the keys of the kingdom. You're going to do all this stuff. And I don't know if he understood all that at that time. I doubt it, really. But, you know, Peter got the right answer. If you get the right answer, don't you feel better about yourself? You know? Sometimes people like me have a hard time raising their hand in the class because they're afraid they're going to have the wrong answer. And so we don't say, we don't speak up, but he wasn't afraid. If he would have given the wrong answer, he still would have spoke up. Right? He just, he's going to talk. He's going to do things. He's that go-to man. You can trust him that he's going to get it done. 
Turn to chapter 18. This is a text you already studied if you're in this class. In chapter 18... Let's see, verse, where do I want to go? 21. Peter says in verse 21 of chapter 18 of Matthew, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to seventy times seven. So Peter was the one who asked that question. How many times should I forgive? Seven? He thought that was pretty generous, right? Seven is a good number. It's a, kind of the complete number. And Jesus said, no, a little more than that. You just keep on forgiving, Peter. And then there was the parable right after that of the unforgiving servant, which you have already studied and talked about. Let's go to Matthew 17. Back up a bit. We remember in Matthew 17 that there was a transfiguration. And who was invited to go to that? You know the answer. See, you guys don't want to answer because I asked the question. Peter, James, and John. Those three were the, the close fellowship, the close friends of Jesus. And... Uh, they were the ones who were privileged to go to the, see him transfigured before them. They saw Moses and Elijah. I mean, they saw him. And, and, and who speaks up? You know, it's Peter. And what did Peter say? This is a good thing we're here. Let, he said, let me make you three tabernacles. He didn't say let us. <laughs> I will do it. He's always ready to step forward and he's going to get something done. And, and he's not afraid. But I mean, he was obviously confused and flabbergasted. But he wanted to say something. He wanted to do something. And he, he said, I'll do it. I'll do it. That's our Peter. That's Jesus' first chosen disciple. Okay. Yeah, well, I, first I saw, I said, let me, let I. Verse 4, Peter said, Lord, it is good for us to be here if you wish. I will make three tabernacles here, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. That's what New American Standard said. That's why I said that. So, I, I like my version better. <laughs> anyway, he said, let I. You know, I will do it. Maybe he said, let us. Either way, he's the one that decided, he's the one that said, this is something ought to be done, right? So he's ready to go. He's always going to do something. And he wants to do what's right. Okay, Matthew 26. You know the text we're going to, so... We have the Passover instituted, or the Lord's Supper instituted during this Passover feast. In verse 31, Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because of me this night. For it was written, I will strike down the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I've been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. But Peter said to him, Even though all may fall away because of you, I will never fall away. And Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you that this very night, before a rooster crows, you will deny me three times. We're all familiar with this story. But Peter goes on to say, Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same thing too. We kind of forget that phrase. All the other disciples took his lead and they also said, oh, yeah, we're not going to desert you either. But Peter was very outspoken. I will not. I'll, I'll even die first. Later on in this same chapter, 
in the garden. Let's just read verse 36 and following. <clears throat> then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, which is James and John, and began to be grieved and distressed. And then he said to them, my soul is deep. Then he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. He went a little beyond them and fell on his face and prayed, saying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, he said to Peter, so you men could not keep watch with me for one hour? Keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. That's a key verse right there, right? Can any of us relate to that verse? The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. How many of us have said we would do this and that for God or Jesus or in the church or whatever? I'm going to do this. We want to. Our spirit is strong in that, but the flesh is weak. So he went again a second time praying, My father, if this cannot pass away unless I drink it, your will be done. Again, this is after the second time, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them again and went away and prayed a third time, saying the same thing once more. Then he came to the disciples and said, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up and let us be going. Behold, the one who betrays me is at hand. So Peter, who wants to prove himself, he couldn't even stay awake, for an hour, and then, I don't know how long Jesus was praying, but longer than that. I would be like him, I'd be falling asleep, even though I meant to stay awake. Has anybody here ever meant to stay awake during a sermon and fell asleep? No, don't tell me. Don't tell me. Okay, let's move on. So, you know what happens. Let's go on with this reading. While he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, came up and accompanied by a large crowd with swords and clubs and came with the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now he, was, now he who was betraying him gave them a sign, saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one, seize him. Immediately Judas went to Jesus and said, Hail, Rabbi, and kissed him. And Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you have come for. And then they came and they laid hands on Jesus and seized him. Behold, one of those who were with Jesus reached and drew out his sword and struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place, for all who take up the sword shall perish by the sword. Or do you not know, or do you not think that I cannot appeal to my Father? He will at once put at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels. And we know who that person was who drew the sword, right? Right? In John, it says it was Peter. And in John, it says Peter cut off the ear of Malchus, right? The right ear. I mean, it's very detailed right there. It was Peter cut off the right ear of Malchus. That's the beauty of having different gospel stories that we can read. So Peter was told, basically, in another scripture, I think it's in John, Jesus says, Stop it! <laughs> Why would Peter do such a thing? Was he trying to prove what he said at, at the Lord's Supper? I will even die for you. Right? Didn't he say that? I, I'll never deny you. I'll even die for you. And Jesus says, uh-huh. Right. You know, you're going to betray me. You're going to deny me three times. Tonight. It's like Peter says, no, I'm not. I'm prove it to you. So we don't know. I mean, that's, all, that's a fascinating story. We don't know if Malchus saw this sword and ducked and then he just got the ear or just Peter was a fisherman and didn't know how to use the sword correctly and just cut off the right ear. Maybe he's aiming for the left. We don't know all that kind of stuff. But he did something impulsively and powerfully and Jesus had to fix it.
Let's turn over to John, John 13. Let's back up a little bit. In John 13, we see the, the washing of the disciples' feet. In chapter 13, verse 5, he began to pour water in the basin, began to wash the disciples' feet, to wipe them with the towel which he had girded. He came to Simon Peter. He said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? He said, uh, what I do to you, you do not realize now, but you will understand hereafter. And Peter said to him, never shall you wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Then Peter changed his mind, of course, says, Lord, then not wash only my feet, but also my hands and my head. So we understand that story, but there's another place where Peter said, Never. Right? You're never going to wash my feet. Oops, that was wrong. I'll never deny you. He's going to find out that was wrong. Has anybody here ever said never and had to eat those words? I have. Several times. And if you haven't, take heed lest you fall. Right? I will never do this. I will never do that. In John chapter 13, verse 31, Therefore when he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and will glorify him immediately. Little children, I am with you a little while longer. You will seek me. And as I said to the Jews, now I also say to you, Where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Who speaks up next? Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered, where I go, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow later. And Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you right now? I will lay down my life for you. There it is again. And Jesus answered, Will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, a rooster will not crow until you deny me three times. Well, as Paul Harvey used to say, the rest of the story, right? Let's go back to the uh, Matthew account. In Matthew 26, let's see, he's betrayed. Let's look at verse 69. Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him and said, You too were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you are talking about. That's number one. Who scared him? Mighty, strong, impetuous fisherman Peter, who was going to willing to die for Jesus. I'll never forsake you. I'm, you know, argh. who scared him off? A girl. Isn't that what it says? A servant girl questioned him. And for some reason, his mighty mean to up and left. You would think it'd take more than that, right? But let's look at ourselves, right? Sometimes we cave and the situation is maybe not that brave or that big a deal. We, we don't do what we meant to do. We fall short, sometimes maybe quickly. Maybe we're tired, maybe we're weak, we're, we're sick, maybe we're just exhausted. Maybe whatever. We, we're just, we're down. 
obviously the situation where Peter thought he was doing a good thing and Jesus fixed it, the sword thing, that didn't work out. He's, he's probably disappointed in all that and then Jesus is taken away. And it's like, what's going on here? He's losing his what? He's losing his what? Confidence? Did somebody else say something? His cool? He's losing his cool? He's losing his confidence? You might even say he's a little bit losing his faith. Kind of. He still believes in Jesus, but this is not going the way he wanted it to go. And now a girl asks him, aren't you one of them? No, I don't know what you're talking about. We, we can be hard on him, but I want us to think about ourselves too in this. He's very human. I don't even know what you're talking about, verse 70. Verse 71, when he had gone out to the gateway, another servant girl, a servant saw him and said to those who were there, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. Again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. It's getting more pronounced. Right? It's not, well, I don't even know what you're talking about. Now it's, I don't know him. A little later, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Surely you too are one of them. For even the way you talk gives you away. So he had a different accent, a different way of talking. Be like a southerner talking in Minnesota, right? You can tell them apart. I can't even talk like Minnesotans. It's, kind of, it's almost Canadianish, right? And Canadians are almost like the North Pole, so... It's different. But he had an accent that gave him away and he gives his third his third denial. So, what happens next? I lost my place. I'm too busy talking and I lost my place. 74. And he began to curse and yeah, he began to curse and swear. I do not know the man. So the Bible leaves out the cursing and the swearing. We can be thankful for that. We don't know what he said, but it wasn't nice. We don't know what he said, but it wasn't good. He didn't just say, I don't know Jesus. He even cursed. And immediately a rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the word which Jesus had said before a rooster crows. You will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. So, his denials became very real to him after the fact when he heard the rooster crow. And you know that God made sure he heard that rooster crow. He wept bitterly. So what, it, what, it was, what was he feeling at that time, you think? I mean, isn't this really... Like, yeah, it's huge disappointment, but he has been with the Son of God. He knew he was the Christ. Didn't he make that confession? So I'll die for you. I'll, can I go with you? I want to go with you. So you can't go right now. But I want to go. I'll die for you. No, no, you won't. You can't even say you know me. You can't even say you, you like me. You can't even say anything good about me because you're even... You're going to curse me. Jesus didn't say that, but he knew it was going to happen. Good point. So 
Peter was trying to figure it out himself and try to fix it himself and, and failed miserably. Okay, I look up there for a clock and all I see is a camera. <laughs> what time is it, camera? Okay, what time is it? How much time do we have? 15 minutes? Okay, well, let's spend the last 15 minutes talking about after Jesus' resurrection. <clears throat> Where was it that Jesus tells Peter to go tend my sheep, all that business? Does anybody remember that scripture? Okay, so turn your Bibles to John. Of course, we're skipping a lot of stuff, but we have studied these things, so it's nothing that we're not knowledgeable about. We know that he was crucified. We know he was buried. And we know he was risen. He rose from the dead. And, and Mary... Uh, was weeping outside the tomb and the angel said, what are you weeping for? <clears throat> okay, so anyway. Pardon? John. Yeah, John 21 is where we're going to get to. So anyway, Jesus uh, made some appearances to, uh, to disciples and by the way, every time he appears to them, they don't recognize him right away. Every single time he appears after his resurrection, they don't recognize him at first sight. It's something he has to allow them to see. I don't understand it exactly, but it seems like every account, they didn't just say, oh, hey, there goes Jesus. No, they didn't. I mean, they, people walked next to him and didn't know it was him until he revealed it to them that it was Jesus. Well, in chapter 21, after these things, Jesus manifested himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and he manifested himself in this way. Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathanael of Cana in Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and two others of his disciples were together. And Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. Isn't that where Jesus found him? Very beginning. I'm going to make you fishers of men now, not fishers of fish. But now they're sitting there do you think Peter is still feeling guilty? Has he been publicly or, you know, he has seen Jesus. Maybe Jesus talked to him or whatever, but we don't see where there's a public way or <clears throat> any words where Jesus said, I forgive you for what you did. We don't see that yet, do we? If, if you do, show me where it is. I'd be glad to look at it. So my question is, do you think Peter is still feeling poorly over his decisions, his choices? Obviously, he's very excited that Jesus is alive and well. He said, I'm going to go fishing. And they said to him, hey, we'll come with you. <laughs> so they went out and they got in the boat and, and all, all that night they caught what? Nothing. And when day was now breaking, Jesus stood on the beach, yet the disciples did not know it was Jesus. There's that thing. We don't, they don't know it was him, but he's there. And you could say, well, it's early morning. You can't see anything anyway. You know, it's, it's, everything's blurry and, and all that. It's kind of like when I went elk hunting one time in my life with my brother in the mountains of Colorado. And we went so early. We spent the night and didn't sleep anything because it's so stinking cold. And we wake up. We go early. We go out there and I got my rifle and I'm looking at the days just trying to break. And I'm sure that's an elk. I mean, I'm so excited. My heart's beating. I know that's an elk. And I can't wait. And it's a tree. So anyway, early morning you can't see things very good, right? By the way, when I did see an elk, I froze. I couldn't pull the trigger. I'm not a good hunter. I'm not like Derek, the great, right? The great hunter. Yeah, I, I, I just couldn't do it. But anyway, so they go fishing. They see somebody. on. They, they didn't know it was Jesus yet. 
And Jesus said to them, Children, you do not have any fish, do you? And they answered him, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you'll find a catch. So they cast, and they were not able to haul it because of the, the great number of fish. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It's the Lord. So just now they see it's the Lord. And then when Simon Peter heard it was the Lord, what did he do? He what? Yeah, he Yeah, he 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 connected his his robe or his tunic or whatever it was, his clothing. I'm not sure how he if he actually put it on or he just connected it to himself, because he was basically naked out there, almost fishing, and he didn't want to go see Jesus looking like that, so he had to take his clothes, and he just dove in the water and he swims ashore and he lets those guys deal with the fish. Right? <laughs> I love that story. You guys can get the fish. He's not even thinking fish. He's thinking Jesus. So even though he had denied Jesus three times, he's very eager to be in Jesus' presence. That's a neat thing. He knows the quality of who Jesus is. And <clears throat> so he wanted to go. So anyway, let's look back at the text. The other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from the land, but about 100 yards away, dragging the net full of fish. So they couldn't lift it in. They had to just drag it to shore. When they got up on the land, they saw charcoal and fire already laid and fish placed on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of those fish which you have now caught. And Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of large fish, 153, and although there were so many, the net was not torn. So what do you see in that text right there about Peter? <clears throat> Is he eager to prove himself still? Seems like it. Get the fish. I'll get it. It says Peter went and got it. And there was a lot of fish. What does it say? He <laughs> pulled those fish up on land. I don't know if other guys helped. It didn't say that. But if it's just Peter, what a brute, right? Because they were large fish. And so it's like, I'll get it, I'll get it. It's almost like, you know, I messed up, but I'm going to prove again that I am worth something to you. Even if just getting this fish, I'm going to get this. I may be reading in too much, but this is, this is how Peter is. He went to get the fish, and he drags the fish up. So Jesus gives them breakfast, and we're not going to talk about whether... It was a miraculous fire and a miraculous fish and a miraculous bread. You know, it probably was. Jesus can do whatever he wants, but it was there, and that's not the point. Jesus said, come have breakfast. And none of the disciples ventured to question him, who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord, Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and the fish likewise. Now this is the third time that Jesus was manifested to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. And when he had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, notice he doesn't say Peter in this text at all. What does Peter mean? Rock. So he, he addresses him like he, had, he was at the very beginning when he met him. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And the question we might ask is, what is these? What's the comparison to? I'm not exactly sure. Some people think it's, do you love me more than these things, like fishing boats, fishing nets, fishing, all that. Some people think it's that. And other people think it's, do you love me more than these disciples love me? You know, this comparison thing. So I'm not exactly sure. I can't tell you exactly what he meant. But he said, do you love me more than these? And his word for love is agapeo, that agapeo biggest, richest love we can have. It's a decision to do the best. Jesus asked him, Simon, son of John, do you agape me more than these? And he says, yes, Lord. You know that I phileo you. It's a different love. That love is that brotherly love, that affectionate love. So Peter says, you know I have strong affection, kinship for you. That's, I, you know I've got that love for you. Right? Then what did he say? 
Tend my lambs. Take care of my lambs. Nurture the lambs. The young ones. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Agapeo. He said, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo you. I love you with affection. He said to him, shepherd my sheep. What is Jesus doing here? Next he says a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? This time he says, Jesus says, Simon, do you phileo me? This time Jesus turns the word to what Peter was saying, do you brotherly love me? Do you affectionately love me? And Peter is frustrated now because he's already told him that two times and he's grieved. He said a third time, do you love me? He says, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And that's the same word, phileo. And Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. How many times did Jesus, or was Jesus denied by Peter? Three times. How many times did Jesus ask him if you love me? Three times. What's Jesus doing here? He's restoring Peter and restoring his confidence, letting him know, I have work for you in my kingdom, and this is what you will do. You're going to tend, tend my lambs, my little ones, my young ones in the faith. You're going, to, you're going to feed the sheep, the more mature, you know, the older one. You're going to f- take care of them. All this, you're going to tend everybody. You're going to tend my sheep. You're going to tend the lambs. You're going to shepherd the sheep. You are going to be a shepherd in my church. You have a job to do. I am commissioning you to do this. You are restored in the full fellowship. You have work to do, so get with it. He didn't say it that way. But you know what I'm getting at. That's what, he's, that's what Jesus is doing. He's, he allowed him, he denied him three times, but he gives him three chances again to say, I love you. And now Jesus says, okay, you love me, this is what you're going to do. And Peter did it. Right? Peter died faithful. It's a loving story. How many times do we fall short in God's eyes? How many times do you ask for forgiveness? Well, John, I think I'm past 70 times 7 already. We'll keep on asking, right? It's a great story. I mean, none of us have openly and blatantly said, I don't even know Jesus, I don't think. And Jesus not only forgives him, he restores his confidence, he restores his position, and even in, in Peter's response after this, in, during this situation, you notice, he is not brash at this time. Did you notice that? It's kind of like, I know I should say I agape you, but you know I love you, I affectionately care about you. He wasn't boldly saying, Jesus, you know, I'll die for you. He didn't say it here. But here, he is humbly taking the restoration of his Savior. And then he runs with it to the very end. That's what we need to do, right? Anybody have any comments about Peter and Jesus and this restoration story? It's okay. I won't. I won't say you're wrong. <laughs> right. Right, good point. We didn't follow cleverly devised tales. You know. All right, appreciate your time. Class is over.